All right, welcome everybody to Art and Odd Places 2022, What's Your Story? And welcome to the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, which is the space you now find yourselves in. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, along with my partner, Don Jokum. And we are, we like to say, a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the service that we provide, is holding this space for queer culture. Um, we're an all-volunteer organization. Louis Polanco is our volunteer helping us out tonight. And that's how we make this work. We sell books, we show art, and we do lots of events like this. Uh, and if you're not already on our email list and you'd like to be, you can sign up for that by the register and you'll get an email every other Monday about our many upcoming events. And we have a lovely exhibition that just opened yesterday, Satanic Panic by Catalina Schliebener Munoz. Um, so we're super happy to have that as well. So it's a very active time right now at the Bureau. <laughs> And for art and watch purposes. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Ferruccio and we're going to get work started. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight here at Bureau of General Services Queer Division and virtually on YouTube for Art and Odd Places 2022 Story. What's your story? Tonight, we have the pleasure of being joined by Yu Ching Wang. Nick Daniels, Yana Greiner, Heather Sincavage, and Juan Hernandez with MyTran. My name is Ferruccio Von Pukummer, and I'm the Executive Director of Art Not Places. In addition to the artists on view tonight, I'm joined by story curator Jessica Lee Blinkhorn, AIOP founder Ed Woodham, Executive Assistant Natalie Ortiz, Curatorial Assistant Gretchen Bittenvoss, PR Marketing uh, Strategist Amanda Wu, and several volunteers that helped us out throughout the day. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, and uh, Pearson Brown, volunteer coordinator. <laughs> I'm looking right at her. Uh, before, we got, before we get started, a little backstory on AIOP. For those who don't know, Art in Odd Places began as an action by a group of artists led by Ed Woodham in Atlanta for the Cultural Olympiad of the 1996 Olympics. In 2005, after moving back to New York City, Ed reimagined AIOP as a response to the disappearance of public space and personal civic liberty, civil liberties, first in the Lower East Side in East Village and since 2008 on 14th Street in Manhattan. AIOP has always been a grassroots project fueled by the goodwill and inventiveness of its participants. Art in Odd Places aims to stretch the boundaries of communication in the public realm by presenting artworks in all disciplines outside the confines of traditional public space regulations. I became executive director at the end of 2021. Thanks to our gracious and generous hosts, Greg Newton and Donnie Hokum. I hope I pronounced that right. Jokum. Jokum, sorry. <laughs> Here at Bureau of General Services Queer Division. And now on to the show. I'll pass it off to Jessica to begin. Okay, hold on. We're going to have to do a quick adjustment. Can <laughs> take my phone and hold it on? I just have to move, remove an appendage. Can you guys hear me? No, I'm from the South. We're used to yelling. <laughs> so, um, Good, e uh, good evening and welcome everybody um, to What's Your Story? Um, my name is Jessica Elaine Blinkhorn. I'm an interdisciplinary artist based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, as introduced by Farisha Wampukamer, our director, uh, I am the curator of this year's um, Art and Arts 2002 or 2022 uh, festival story. Um, we are so pleased to have had artists from the disabled, aging, LGBTQ+, BIPOC, allied, and incarcerated communities answer our, car, our call to show. To I swear, I'm usually more articulate, guys. <laughs> I'm very much more articulate. Whew. To to show your stories. 
Um, I actually wanted to, when Ed and Frusia came to me about curating, um, I was excited uh, because Ed actually gave me my very first opportunity to come to New York and show my work. And for someone from Atlanta, Georgia, living with a disability, that's like huge, <laughs> yeah, huge. I'm like, I remember seeing Bunny Lebowski, I like Dick Lebowski and the one throwing paint. I was wondering, I was wanting to be her, you know? Um, but it, it changed my life. So the opportunity to actually curate for uh, Art Not Places was a huge honor. And I am so lucky and privileged to have worked with people that I've worked with for this, this past seven months. And I'm happy that this is happening tonight. Um, I wanna say thank you once again for joining us. But um, after this, you know, please remember we'll have a Q and A and you can hear me talk some more. I know I'm lovely and charming and you wanna hear me talk all night. <laughs> but we're gonna get on to our artists. So let's start with Nick Daniels. Considered a pioneer in the Pittsburgh dancing, Nick M. Daniels is the founding artistic director of the Dana Movement Ensemble, Dancers Against Normal Action, which he started in 1991. Let's hear it for Nick Daniels. Thank you, everyone. I have my scan code here. So if you want to take a picture and um, give my information, you want to welcome I'll raise it up a couple of different times. Thank you. <clears throat> first things first. I'm a um, dancer and choreographer. I am not a speaker. Um, I let my actions speak louder than words. So um, this could go in many different directions. <laughs> okay, as long as we have that straight, good. So my name is Nick Daniels, and um, I thought about how I wanted to present this, and I, I was like, well, everybody has a story, but my story has so many turns and twists and twirls. Um, but it's my story, and I'm just going to start right from there by saying my name is Nick Marlon Daniels. And I am a uh, transgender person. Uh, let's start with that, transgender person. I went through a transition point and I was ready to go, went through therapy, went through everything, but the enzymes and the um, drugs that I needed to have to go through the transition, trans, transition um, did not play nice with my body. Um, I, almost died. <laughs> I have um, an, alert, an allergy to uh, bromamine, which is um, a pineapple enzyme, which is prevalent in mostly every drug that when you're doing your trans transition, uh, that's one of the more prevalent things because it's stabilizing. So uh, I had to, <laughs> I was one of the first people to say, you have a choice. You can either become a woman, which you always wanted to do, or you could die. So I was like, well, hmm. <laughs> let's, let's think about this. So going through more therapy and realizing that I'm me, it goes way beyond um, gender identity. It goes way beyond anything, uh, but I can't be me if I'm not living. So uh, transgender person, I am. And I learned to deal with it and my family learned to deal with it. Uh, they had to deal with the raging, screaming, horrible hormones. <laughs> but uh, that's where that was. And um, during that transition point, I also took a 20-year break from uh, dancing. It was too much. Um, funding was too much. Uh, not having technology, because I am 54 years old. So uh, when I started my company, no internet. <laughs> no cute little computers where I can just push a button and um, I'm a digital artist as well as a choreographer. So I couldn't just go boop, 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 boop like that. I had to actually cut film and um, burn film for the effects that I create. Um, to talk about my story is to uh, talk about the work that I'm presenting uh, over this weekend. Um, it is called American Safari. Uh, have you ever gotten film that you're being watched all the time? As a, a black male, 
uh, queer or not, uh, we're looked at differently. Is that taboo to say? Maybe. But I'm one of those people where I had to learn really, really quickly not to care what people think and what people say. And um, so in the development of this work, I made the decision that I was going to tell my story in the most unabashedly way. And that was to show myself as I see myself and how uh, people perceive me. Uh, by doing simple things like walking down the street and eating a hamburger, or you know, going to um, the uh, Louis Vuitton store and um, actually wanting to buy a bag, and without have being questioned for why I would like to buy a woman's bag. Uh, so uh, I stood this afternoon in LaGuardia Airport, and then uh, down. By the is that a pier down there? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I forgot to mention that. So <laughs> in New York City, and um, I've done work um, in the Bronx, but uh, and I've done a couple things in uh, Manhattan, but this is really an experience to spend this much time in New York. Um, yeah, it's, it's a thing. How do you all do it? <laughs> <laughs> But um, as I decided, I said, today I'm going to move a building. And I talked to my uh, volunteer, I said, oh, well, where is the uh, Empire State Building? She goes, um, well, it's not that far, why? I said, we're gonna tether myself to it and move it. She goes, oh, really? Is that, <laughs> is that what we're doing today? And, uh, we talked about it and we said, okay, well, maybe we won't move to Empire State Building, but we are going to um, move the H line. Is that what The High Line. <laughs> and I attempt to move the High Line today. And uh, tomorrow we're going to attempt to move something else. But the struggle is real. And that's all this piece is about. Um, it comes from my heart, my soul. I always say that. When you see my work, it is sloppy sometimes. It is not fun. I am not an Alvin Ailey dancer. I'm not six foot and I'm not 145 pounds. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you know, but what I do do and what my company does uh, is we put our hearts and our soul into what we do and we do it and provide that in a very, very meaningful and impactful way. And um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, having me do this. And um, we have a few rating next year. Please have me back because I already have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> the ideas always come. But uh, this is a time where it's really, really important to be unabashedly you. You can't hide behind anything because right now our rights are being taken away from us like that. So if we are hiding behind all the shit, what do we have? So um, that's my story. Um, we're going to have a Q&A, right? After all the artists. Uh, right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're going to have a Q&A after this. If you have any questions, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you all for listening to me ramble. And uh, that wasn't it. Wasn't, Absolutely terrible, was <laughs> no. uh, But um, thank you so much. I am Nick Daniels, and uh, my company is the Data Movement Ensemble, and we will be performing in the streets tomorrow, uh, probably about 2 o'clock. And um, I'm just so excited and so proud to be able to, to stand here as a uh, transgender Black person uh, who um, is able to do the things that I'm doing and um, and not afraid to do the things I'm doing. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Can I just talk loudly? Can you hear me? Yeah. I feel bad.
Hi, Brian. Can you move the microphone? Don't. Hi, Brian. Can you move the microphone? Don't. Our next artist is Yi Ching Wang. Yi Ching Wang is a Taiwanese interdisciplinary artist based in New York who works in video, performance, installation, and photography. Her recent works focus on exploring the social and cultural elements through her identity to reveal the situation of foreigners, Asians, and immigrants in the US. Uh, let's hear it for Yi Ching Wang. I'm Hi, I'm Ichima, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm from Taiwan, so I'm going to share my story. And uh, my story is about my project in uh, the Art and Art Places uh, story. Uh, it's my project for focus, and it's very small, but I can type it. Um, so I need my notes. <laughs> um, the project is, um, the title is Breathing in New York, and the project is about how I imagine a connection between three seemingly unrelated local current events that happened in March 2020 in New York City. And the first uh, event is the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, in March 2020 in the city and the mask mandate after the outbreak. And the second one is the plastic bag ban that started in March 1st um, in 2020 in New York State. And the third one is my personal experience um, that related to my identity and that also happened in March 2020. Um, my personal story is that, um, is that um, one day I was working on the street and wearing a mask. At that time, uh, it was just a, the beginning of the pandemic. So there were not many people wearing masks. Um, um, when I worked on the street, and two white men passed by me and they said some words of Chinese mask. Um, um, there, like there was just me and them. So it's obvious like they are talking, uh, they were talking about me. Um, it was weird because I am not Chinese and my feeling was so complicated it's not only because of my race, but also of my background. Also Taiwanese, um, the words of China Chinese, the Chinese government are very sensitive to me because of the complicated um, historical, political, and cultural relationship between Taiwan and China. So my feeling was so complicated. And also that was the first time I experienced some kind of discrimination. I came to this country in 2019 and I didn't have experience living with people from diverse cultures. So at that moment, I wasn't even aware that it was kind of racial discrimination because I had never experienced it before. Um, Therefore, I saw that if I covered my head, like my um, skin, my hair, so people cannot like know my identity. So I did a seemingly ridiculous action of covering my head with a keyful plastic bag to hide my identity. That at the same time could be seen as the protection against the COVID-19. And about the Keyful plastic bag. It was um, it's a, another small story. Um, I had a lot of these plastic bags um, when I was living in a dormitory. Uh, the keyful market was the nearest supermarket, so I had many of them in my cabinet. Um, 
I didn't have a special feeling for them. Um, these plastic bags were just trash to me. Um, but after the plastic bag ban, I realized that I could not get any new this plastic bag. So at the time, these plastic bags turned from trash to treasure to me. So, um, so because of that um, new thoughts, I thought of myself and my identity, my situation in this city and in this country. Um, wearing a plastic bag might be um, not only for hiding my identity, but also to avoid being defined by others. Um, I want to and try to get back the right to define myself um, through my project. Like, I am who I am like that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ichiro. Our next artist is Jana Greiner. <laughs> Jana Greiner is an installation artist from Taos, New Mexico, whose art relies heavily on form, concept, and material. They are a graduate of the University of New Mexico's Fine College of Fine Arts. Jana identifies as a queer interdisciplinary artist making art for mental health. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks you all. I'm really excited to be here. I'm definitely in culture shock. I drove here from Taos, New Mexico. It took me three and a half days to get here. Last weekend, I was engulfed in a festival that I helped produce a lot like this, where I met Jessica um, three, four years ago now. She was an artist on the streets of Taos, and um, we became friends then. This week, I did that festival. I was out on the street in the middle of the night and going into headquarters. Taos is a very small rural community, so there's about 8,000 people. We invited about 3,000 people out to the streets to see 30 artists. And in the middle of the night, at the end of the night, on Friday night, the first night, I went into headquarters and there was a man in there without his shoes on. I was, it was pitch dark and I had a headlamp. So my headlamp was pointing up at him from my chest and I screamed bloody murder in his face. And then I took a deep breath and I screamed bloody murder again in his face. And this man, once I stopped screaming at him said he was the security and he was waiting <laughs> to, be, to meet his boss. But he didn't say the right words to me. He didn't say the name of his boss who I had hired for security that night. So luckily my lead of tech just pulls into the parking lot right then. She gives me a phone call and I say, Chelsea, get in here, there's a man. She comes in and she talks to the man and she shoes him out. She calms me down. I have a really good cry. We go on with our festival. The next day, everybody's treating me like, it's okay, Jenna, just take a rest. We got this, right? So it's the second night, so everything went much better. Thank God. And on Sunday, we wrapped everything up. 30 artists went home to all of their places around the world. And on Monday morning, I got in a car. I got in a car with my giant five and a half foot microphone to bring here to New York City so that people can share their stories on the street. And I'm in a really weird place in my life where my daughter passed away in the last year. And I don't really know why I'm here except for art seems to be the one thing that's keeping me here. It's grounding me. It's making me realize this is the way we connect with one another. And when I got here, and today I took my microphone out on the street and people started sharing their stories. And at first it was slow and it was weird, but it was really cute. It was really sweet things about their childhood, their first kiss or their, what they thought about their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally someone really just let loose and they talked about connection and they talked about showing up for one another. And that felt like it was purpose. It was a reason to bring this microphone and to keep making art and to come and share a story with one another. So I just wanted to say thanks for this opportunity, you all. Thanks for having me here in New York and embracing me. And I appreciate you all. That's my story.
Give me a second, guys. Kind of, I'm a sensitive person, so that kind of got to me a little bit. Um, our next artist is Heather Sinkovich. Heather Sinkovich is a performance artist who studies gender-based violence and its ramifications. <coughs> Her work has appeared in the Tate Modern during a tenement at the Queen's Museum, a Grace Exhibition Space, a live at Satellite during Miami Art Week, and galleries across the United States and Europe. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of Art Not Spaces, uh, Places, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Places, spaces, right? Um, but also to uh, share my story tonight. Um, as Jessica mentioned, um, I study intimate partner violence um, for the reason that I am a victim of intimate partner violence. Um, this was over 20 years ago, and um, over these number of years, I have, um, have been sort of coming to terms with what that means and what that has been meant to me and accepting that it is going to be the trajectory of traje trajectory of my life. Um, I've, I've accepted that this is something that I will continually re um, be reconciling really. Um, and part of that has been that I have um, memories that I had lost and over the years have sort of regained. And some of that has been the circumstances that um, brought me there. And some of it has been the circumstances as to what happened during that time. So I wrote because I can't trust myself. So I, I'm going to read um, just a, a, a little bit about how I got there. In 1999, I bought a car I couldn't drive. I was, it was a maroon 1980 standard shift Volvo 240. I really loved it. I, I bought it with money I received from a scholarship um, in graduate school. Um, at that time, I was living in Seattle. Um, I was on my own and I thought, okay, I can buy a car outright. This is a really good move. <laughs> I took my boyfriend at the time to test drive it and then I bought it and he drove it off the lot. My car became kind of an excellent metaphor for what our situation was. Um, it was all mine, but I didn't know how to drive stick. My boyfriend drove my car a lot. He took it places we needed to be. And if he didn't want to be somewhere, he would leave. And there wasn't really anything that I could do with that um, because although it was mine, I couldn't drive the car. He called kind of all the shots. Um, I was always a pretty ambitious student, um, not the best student, but well-meaning and hardworking. I probably have some sort of learning disability that I'm too old for to, it to matter really anymore. <laughs> but I prided myself in working hard and I loved being in an academic setting to build my practice. I took a bus from my Capitol Hill apartment, even though I had um, a car, uh, to my campus studio and I spent hours and sometimes days at the studio. And even though I had the car and I bought the car, um, I bought it so I could have more flexibility and use it to run errands and you know make, a, make my way around Seattle. Um, but I had to learn to drive it. Uh, my boyfriend would use it almost as a tool for a manipulation. Um, silly symbol of my incompetence. He would remind me of my stupidity. In retrospect, I can see that all clearly. The control, the emotional manipulation, the sabotage, the paranoia. Um, I couldn't see it then. Um, his insecurity masked, basically, was masked by all my shortfalls. I should have left when he first drugged me. I should have left when he shoved me into furniture and accused me of outlandish things. I should have left when he lost my cat and refused to look for him. I should have left when he said he couldn't hold down a job because of his allergies. He should have, I should have left after days of silent treatment. One time I did leave. He was so awful that I stormed out of his apartment, got in my car and trusted I could drive it. I had been watching all of this time and now I had to rely on myself and I did it. I drove the hills, stopped at stoplights, didn't grind the gears or roll back. I drove my car. And this was a newfound confidence that actually allowed me to open up. I told three of my friends that he was hurting me and I asked for help and my friends didn't believe me. How could my nice guy boyfriend be this monster I spoke of? 
I slipped back into myself, embarrassed and feeling delusional. Uh, we graduated, left Capitol Hill, moved to West Seattle, which is a section of the city is only reachable by bridge or ferry. So I carried on this cycle of honeymoon accusations, physical altercations, silent treatment. I accepted that I was bringing this on myself as a cycle world in unexpected fury. No one had believed me, so it had to have been me. But I could drive my car now and I would work in Seattle and I would re return every night to our home in West Seattle. I brought my self flowers once on the way home from work to rem and I remember as he tore them up and knocked me in the furniture and accused me of sleeping around. Going to work as a housekeeper at an inn was a reprieve from my own mess. I finally told him I wanted things to be over and he told me that if we left Seattle and rebuilt our life elsewhere, things would be different. They were. Uh, we moved into my parents' home in Pennsylvania where he treated us all poorly. There I finally told him it was over for good and there he attacked me in the white guest room filled with my sister's childhood furniture. He charged, he charged my room, pulled me from the bed, stomped my chest, legs as I slapped his face and head. He finally strangled me on the floor as as he kicked, as I kicked and slapped my way free. My parents had been away and I barricaded myself into a bathroom. He, uh, he told me that he would kill my parents when they arrived home and I couldn't leave. My parents didn't leave my side for months. I was a shell of myself. He went on to send unsettling messages, park a block over from my home until he finally was just gone. Now in thinking about who I am and what my story is, I realized my story is like many others. Creating my story was a painful and isolating experience, but my story is more common than we would like to admit. One in four women in our country have been, been impacted by abuse. My practice has helped me reconcile much of what has happened to me, but it, important has been rebuilding myself and trusting those around me. Shifting the attitudes of judgment and disbelief towards victims is what I try to stand for. Creating my community built on trust and friendship has been incredibly difficult. The garment I made for my performance for Art in Odd Places is a gesture that exemplifies that. I asked women if they would contribute to a garment that I would wear. It's almost like an albatross around my neck, but also a source of comfort. Over 30 women contributed to my garment and many confessed their own stories of violation, abuse, and loss. It is a devastating reality to my performance, but I try to honor their pain as a beacon of visibility for victims. I will never be the same because of what, I, what happened. It is an, an inescapable presence, and that can swallow me up at times, but it can also motivate me. And I've been through the worst of it and survived. I can tell my story so other women, women know that they are not alone. And I'm here, believe you, to tell you that I'm not imagining things and now I can drive stick. So if you need me, I can pick you up. So thank you. Thank you, Heather. Our next artist is Vivag Sebastian. Vivag is a, an artist who specializes in two-dimensional object making. He focuses on interrogating metaphors, or inter integrating metaphors, uh, its micro and macro analogies, and reactions to multiple points of perspective. He focuses on particular metaphors that answer his questions on his current research or pursuit of understanding. Even. Finally, great to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I usually describe myself as a painter. Um, and I started to realize over the years that it's an excuse to slowly seclude myself in my studio and never have to come out. And <laughs> New York is a great city to hide in. Um, as well as a lot of third world countries who just disappear and nobody knows who you are and what you are. Um, but I've been, I've been interested in the lottery for a long time. Uh, the time when I had come to America, I was born here, but when I came back after uh, studying in India, uh, it was quite shocking to see just the, just exactly what the nature of American capitalism was. It dangles this carrot in front of everybody like, oh, just tomorrow, you pay a little money here, it'll pay off really well. And that entire metaphor I think has um, 
ruled my understanding of how we operate. Like there's a very famous thing, I think it's, we're all temporarily embarrassed billionaires, um, which I don't really agree with, but it's there. So that's what we're gonna do. But my story is about even the, how the lottery, this carrot that has been dangling over people's head has slowly um, become too expensive for people to even take part in. It used to be that you could find lottery tickets all over the place, scratch offs everywhere. You could find a lottery a place that sold the lottery, any corner that you turned into. People think that it's a lot of it is due to gentrification that we don't have as many stores that sell lottery tickets anymore. But I have a good friend of mine who works at a corner store and he was trying to tell me that in general, people just don't buy the lottery anymore. The only people who do have a spare buck or two to trade in for the lottery just with loose change that they have. And what it means to me is that it's a, it's a sign that the minimum threshold for buying the lottery um, has dropped out. It, funnily enough, in New York City or New York State, Nassau County is a place that people buy the most amount of lottery tickets. If you know anything about New York State, it's a pretty wealthy county. Uh, it's got, I think, the highest property tax rate and so on. It's mainly wealthy retirees who go in and just sit there and buy lottery tickets, drink beer, scratch offs, buy lottery tickets. And that's exactly who the new um, consumer class of lottery tickets are. So my project initially was to go into these places that sold lottery tickets and make lucky charms for people. You see, if everything is taken from these folks who are buying lottery tickets, then I figured, well, why don't I just give them something that they can just get? If you buy the lottery ticket, you get a good luck charm. You just get the good luck that my good luck charm would provide you. Nothing else. So along 14th Street, there are six stores that sell lottery tickets. There's two newsstands that also sell lottery tickets. Nobody wanted this talisman in there. One person did, but only because he saw my phone wallpaper was an Indian goddess and thought I was like a weirdo right-wing BJP guy, if you know anything about Indian <laughs> politics. So he was like, yeah, buddy, do whatever you want. And another person was like, why would you want to do this? What are you getting out of it? There's nothing you're getting out of it. And then literally tried to kick me out of the store because he was just like, could not understand what the point of this was. Um, it's pretty funny. And then, you know, uh, you had managers who are saying, well, I got to talk to the owner. The owner said, never calling me back. People saying, yeah, yeah, I'll give the phone number. Some people, some of the managers really like the idea saying, here's the phone number, you should call them. Nobody picks up. It, what you end up finding out is that, that most of these small businesses that I thought might be, you know, mostly sort of immigrant run, I thought they'd be, they'd have some em empathy towards the struggling people of America. Uh, most of them also live in Nassau County. <laughs> most of them just come into town for an hour, pick up all their cash and then go. They don't care what happened at the store. They don't know anything that's happening in the new neighborhoods that their stores run out of. Uh, and that left me at a loss because if I didn't want, if I couldn't install something, then I was just going to do it. I was just going to like epoxy it onto their walls or something like that. <laughs> Thankfully, conversations with Jessica, conversations with Ed made me realize that maybe that's not the most. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, and so I think for the first time, I'm actually getting back into, or not getting back into, discovering performance as an opportunity. What I'll be doing is I will be sort of, self-orientalizing self -orientalizing Indian soothsayer who will be sitting on a mat somewhere along 14th Street, providing lucky charms for people. If you come and talk to me, we can talk about what you want your luck, good luck charm to be. We'll make a lucky charm for you. Uh, it'll be based off a lottery ticket because guess what? I've collected a lot of lottery tickets and I <laughs> don't know what to do with them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you. Our final artist that we are uh, going to be uh, that we'll be we'll be talking about say is uh, Juan Hernandez. Juan Hernandez is an incarcerated artist born and raised in Chicago. His artwork has been featured in Latino Rebels and exhibited at Angelica Kaufman Gallery, Dragonfly Gallery, and the Fulton Street Collective. You can find his work online at Instagram.com slash jch underscore convict art, convicted art. Um, speaking on behalf of Juan Hernandez, it's my track. Thank you. Hi, 
and by I'm going to be playing a recording that Juan made since he isn't able to be here in person. It's about the side jobs he does to make his art possible, which is probably relatable for a lot of folks here. Um, let me know if the sound is off. When I first started to see myself as a person beyond this, it was difficult to
this time, I would like for all the artists to come up and join me so that we can have our Q&A session. <laughs> Need a bigger stage. <laughs> I've done this one time, but um, the previous time I just do I just did like one hour. And at that time, I have a um, photographer or uh, record the process. <coughs> but I haven't had that long time <coughs> that performance like today. I'm curious what the response has been. Um, this, how do people react? <coughs> how, do you, how do people react to your face on the comments? Uh, the, <coughs> people usually people just just um see the watch like watch but um I found like in the interesting part is when I see many people look at me and. Some people like laugh or like they see me like in very strange um, like appearance, like, mm, like that. I think it's interesting because um, it's a, um, a new, like different experience to me because usually when I walk on street, no one, like people will not care about me. So, oh, so in the performance, um, that's interesting when everyone noticed me. Some people will come closer for like take photo, <laughs> but usually people just like pass me and they keep look at me. How do we see all the performances that are happening? Do you mean like in terms of a schedule or just? Um, yeah, where are people located? So uh, we have a website, artandonplaces.org, um, but then also we partnered with Pollinate this year to provide an interactive kind of interactive map so uh if you go to pollinate's website it's just pollinate.com and uh they have a list of events where under art not places and they have a more detailed map of where all of our artists are and what days they'll be presenting that way you don't have to dig through like our schedule section in our website and kind of piece together where people are going to be and stuff it, it's all out there Sorry, that was pollinate? Pollinate, yes. So I guess this is for everyone here. What is the strangest reaction you got today? Or the <laughs> strangest interaction that you received today? Someone got into my environment. 
like I was tethered to the um, high line, <laughs> and this woman just came in, like I'm barricaded. There's a bar here, there's a bar there. I'm wrapped in rope and I'm doing my thing. And I look and there's a woman in my environment. So I just, she looked at me and I looked at her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I continued on with my thing. Uh, and it's interesting because my work, uh, this particular work is based in um, Bhutto, which is very, very slow moving, uh, but it, my mind is completely focused on each movement in each moment because that moment's going to go away as soon as I end it. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm in my thing, I'm in my groove, I'm in this really cool contortion like this, and I'm like, you're my environment. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was. I'm waiting to see if that's going to happen again. <laughs> Strange interactions today. Well, I just saw this man who didn't want to talk into the microphone, but he wanted to talk to me about words because he was a philosopher for many years. And he says that words were, are misconstrued now from their original meaning. And he was very good friends with the Oxford Dictionary. He wanted to, <laughs> to, to let me know that could be my friend too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess follow up with that, Jessica, since you've participated in several years, what would you say is the strangest uh, interaction you've had on the street? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I come from a family in the South, so there's no volume knob in my house. <laughs> um, so my first year of performing for Art in Our Places was 2018. It was when Katya was the curator and Katya yeah, was the back by Katya. Um, I did a performance called Grays and Gates. It was based on eyebrow tutorials because I have fabulous eyebrows. People always want to know where I get them done. And I'm like, $150,000 in student loan debt, I can draw some eyebrows. <laughs> um, but I also did this one based on being a, a large, disabled, uh, cisgender female eating in public. For me, eating in public is really difficult. It's even more difficult now since because of the pandemic, my ability to breathe and to function has lowered um, due to lack of being able to get treatments. Um, but back then it was just, you know, if, if my hands get cold, I can't feed myself. So when I go in public, I'm always really reserved um, and afraid to eat because people stare at me because one, I'm a big girl. And, you know, two, I, I drop food. Like me and my sister and brother, we go to restaurants and we would bet on who would drop the most food. I, they always lost. <laughs> <laughs> I joined them in that now. But, um, so I was sitting there and you know my whole performance was I was I was dressed in my what I call my um Bowery meets bovine orthopedic sheep dress that was labeled <laughs> with words that I had been called audible, audibly called like cow, slut, retarded, things like that, all over this dress. And I had my hair in a knot and I had makeup like a cow on my face, and I was sitting in front of a heap of trash in Chelsea, and uh, I had my breasts exposed because, you know, cow udders, and I'm sitting there and I have like a meal laid out on the table and I'm eating, and, you know, the whole idea was to allow people to assist me to see if they would, if they would go out of their comfort zone to just offer the help to somebody, or if they would pass by. Either way, they would have to think about what that said about them, the action of helping or not helping. Um, regardless, I was going to eat, you know, um, so people would walk by and there's a group of kids that were staring and they were like, whoa, and like, I started making faces at them because I'm a large child. Um, <laughs> and I think that in that situation, one of the funniest things that happened was a man rolled past me in his wheelchair and he stared at me. And usually when we stare at each other, it's like, I get it. But he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so he didn't get it. But um, another incident was uh, this guy walked by with his girlfriend 
And I asked this girlfriend, first, I was like, excuse me, would you mind helping me? And she walks right by me. And he goes, I go, excuse me, would you mind helping me? He's like, of course we can. She hits the brakes and backs up. And she's like, of course we can. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like feeding me and holding my wine up. And I go to shake his hand. And he's like, oh, no. And I'm like, you would help me take a bite of my food, but you won't shake my hand? Like, what? But regardless, I thought it was kind of funny that the girlfriend parroted the boyfriend. So she didn't feel like horrible about <laughs> denying the disabled woman assistance. So that was um that was in 2018 and 2021 for normal, which uh, for so fun cover here <laughs> curated. Um, I was selling all of my government government funded uh, items that I received from the government um, for their sticker price. So people could see how much it costs to be disabled, and that's my normal. And I had a box of gloves for sale for $29 because that's the actual price of them. And this woman was like, are these for sale? And I was like, yeah, she's like, for $29? And I'm like, oh, that's what they cost. And she just kind of, she was in a wheelchair too. She just kind of sped off. <laughs> it's really funny. So I guess that was probably my interactions, I guess. There was a gentleman in the back with glasses that raised his hand, I think. Well, uh, I was just going to ask. Nick, when the highland starts to move, where are you going to <laughs> <laughs> That's for me to know and you to buy. <laughs> but I, I, I have some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, this is for the, the person who was uh, assisting Juan uh, Fernandez. Um, do you, do you remember what, or did you hear what autobiography you read that inspired him? The autobiography of Asana Shakur. Asana Shakur? Asana. 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 Okay. Um, and then, you know, kind of a separate one for you. Um, there was a show at PS1 of incarcerated artists. Was he in that, or does he, did he, was that on his radar, or? I think that was the one by Nicole Fleetwood. He wasn't in it, but he has the book. She sent him one. And okay. yeah, there's definitely a whole network of incarcerated artists who work together. Yeah, it was a phenomenal show. It was a part of the art world that I had never thought much about. And then seeing that show was just my world. Thank you. I have a question. What uh, was there interaction to like how did you meet him? I met Juan through Black and Pink, which is a queer pentile organization. He had another friend who was advertising his commissioned art, and then that commissioned something from him. And we started talking that way. And I had a background in writing and pitching articles, um, which is a little bit different than visual art. So we went through the process of learning how to do galleries and festivals together. Um, and he's done a lot of gallery work and different projects since then, um, since access to internet is hard to come by. Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I can just talk about you. Yeah. I had a question for the lottery place. I, you didn't talk about this in your in your presentation, but I thought you could talk more about the symbols on your hand and what the motivation for those were. The I would say that the process of making lucky charms is is like. It's intentionally left esoteric, I guess. Um, just like through conversation with the person, I will be um, deciding what symbols or materials are going to be going into the charm. Uh, in the same way, I felt like that image would be conjured a lot easier if you had just like a you know uh, a storybook character of a person who just like appears jingling and jangling and like. You know, is this is this like Oriental character from Sherlock Holmes or or something of that era? Um, and so I felt like the henna tattoos uh, kind of conjure that same image as, as it's not like associated with normal bridal henna 
Um, yeah. I mean, I have a question for the artist. Is that okay? Last question. <laughs> um, so I have one for Janet. Um, why a large microphone? And I, I'm really interested to know how long it took you to make the microphone. I know you're resourceful. I've seen your work. <laughs> it probably took um, two to three weeks to make. Um, and I think the inspiration was that feeling of um, being a, a femme identified person in the world and not being heard no matter how much I spoke. And like, I still have that experience on the daily of having to repeat myself or, or feeling like you almost have to be hysterical to get your needs met. Um, I often have a recurring dream where I'm uh, falling off a cliff and, and my loved ones are at the top of the cliff and they're not paying any attention to my needs as I'm screaming, help. Um, so the microphone kind of came out of those feelings of just how, how do I feel heard? How do I like make a piece of art where other people feel heard? And then also the fact that it's this huge phallic also feels like it gives me power. Right? I'm, like, I'm going down the street and I'm like needing room to get this giant thing around. <laughs> you know, and it's something I don't necessarily experience with this small body on the daily. So that's been really interesting. Thanks for asking, Jessica. Yeah. And uh, one more question for Heather. So listening to you talk about your work, um, well, having read your proposal and obviously curated you here the show, but listening to you talk about um, the passion that you speak with, um, it comes through in your visual elements. Um, do you feel that by sharing your story, you are, is it your way of kind of cleansing a wound that you think will always kind of be there to better serve your creative process? Is it almost like washing your soul? Um, I think it's more um, understanding the pain, really, and understanding what the healing process is needed. Um, it, it sort of seems to be this sort of wild and uh, wild little pathway that's always uncovering a new turn, you know, and you think you've kind of rectified some things and then, you, you know, all of a sudden there's something that kind of hits you in the face and you're like, oh, wow, I thought I handled this um, and now I need to handle this another way. <laughs> so I, I think it's, it's certainly a process of that, but um, but I, I only started to make work that was directly about my experiences only, um, what, maybe about seven years ago um, for the reason that uh, I think, you know, my whole experience was like first not being believed and then often I find victims you know, have that that sort of contention that they have to deal with, but or the, the pain is too much. You know, it, it's so incredibly common um, how women are treated. And I, I mean, I, I, I teach and I feel like I almost every year I have um, women who show up in my office confessing that they've been raped or hit or, you know, things like that. And I kind of got to a point where I felt as though I need to be vocal and I have enough healing under me where I could be um, and I could do it in a way that would be productive for that discussion and that visibility so that, that's yeah I don't know that it's ever going to wash anything away but it's always sort of a negotiation of um, what how to handle the pain anyone else I'm curious for any of you who have um, displayed your pieces or done your performance or in other cities, if you have found it to be received differently or have you been directed to the community here in the park? So. Um, well, that's an interesting question. But this piece that I'm doing here is um, site specific. So um, it's been uh, performed um, not only in different cities in the States, but also in Italy and um, Spain. And um, it's been done visual, uh, virtually as well. And uh, 
I was moderately concerned when I would, um, applied for this opportunity because um, it's very heavy in video and there's video imagery and um, I created an atmosphere with motion sensors and this is, this is, it's Nick craziness times five. And I was like, well, if it's gonna be outside, how can I do this? Do I wanna do this? And then I was like, yeah, I definitely wanna do it. And um, then I, I was like, well, projectors, nope, can't do it, I'm not doing it. Um, even if I figure out a way, I'm not doing it. Um, how can I present the imagery? And I said, well, I'm going to be the projector at this point. So that's where this whole idea of tethering myself to different places and things uh, became, because that's me being a projection, an object of projection. So um, it's very different. And um, now the process is going to be gathering the video and the clips, the clips that um, are out there and kind of documenting and also using that as the background for the work uh, that I'm going to be setting on um, three of my male dancers again. <laughs> I have a question. Oh. Can, I, can I do two? Is that a... Yeah, no, no, no. I'll ask all the questions. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Vivek, I think, yeah. did I say that right? Vivek. Vivek. Um, I was wondering your background or like your interactions with la the lottery. Um, if it's something that uh, you ever play or people in your family played, um, or if it's more of a separation and you're kind of uh, getting into it now. Uh, my mom plays, um, she, and she always bullies me into buying tickets for her, and I need to shake my head, no, I can't do it. <laughs> it was a fun conversation with my mom. Um, my uncles played a lot growing up, or uh, when they were growing up in India. Um, I think that they got in trouble for it from legally somehow, I don't know how. Um, so there's like... Like going through bookies? Like, I, I think that there's, a, in, in India it's a state-sponsored lottery, and I think they were trying to run their own. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, uh, and then I've, I've just been picking, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in them because they're like candy wrappers to me, a lot of the scratch ups, they're really beautiful. Um, and I also like uh, Memphis hip hop albums and they always look like the covers. <laughs> so I just pack them all the time wherever I go. Um, but I try to make paintings out of them and I try to like keep a couple with me and I do drawings in the back. But I've never actually like got down and played. I've talked to a lot of people who play and get into this conversation. It's always like a conversation of shame for a lot of folks. But then I'm like, no, 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 please, I, I, you're like losing tickets. I would love to like take them from you or whatever. And that's why I have why most of my collection is from losing tickets that people just give to me. Um, and the charms are made out of the lucky charms. Tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lottery tickets. At this point, lucky charms and lottery tickets are synonymous. When you first started talking, I thought you were like giving people bowls of cereal. With <laughs> 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 lottery tickets? Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. as you were talking, I was like, oh, <laughs> lucky charms. Not yeah. cereal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you, I think I have, um, if you find me, I will have uh, Texas lottery um, tickets and New York lottery tickets. So you get to pick. Mm -hmm. It's a series of sizes and states. Those two states, actually. And you, you live in Texas? I'm from Texas, yeah. Okay. I grew up in Texas. All right. Some lottery tickets. You were like, so the lottery ones up there all the time. Come on, because. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to get to the question for the organizer first, and then maybe the others, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the relationship between our athletes and people keeping the street as a place, which has changed so much in the past. Years. It, and then I guess the artists like that kind of work a lot on 14th Street. So sometimes you don't know when art out place is actually happening because it's, it can be in hot place. And so <laughs> if you know there's people who would live and work on 14th Street are so sensitized to you know things happening again, I know that this is an art exhibit and maybe that sort of lack of engagement from an audience could be because they just like too much. Um, so <laughs> is there like timing that says, hey, this is a uh, to stop and see. 
Well, the person who would really be best equipped to answer this question is Ed, but uh, he had to go a little early, so I'll do my best. But um, in my understanding, Arnott places that originally, when it came to New York, it was in the Lower East Side to begin with, because uh, that's where kind of all the artsy people were. And <laughs> um, there was a big community there uh, that could support the festival. Um, and then it eventually moved to 14th Street because of the fact that it was more public. There were more spaces that uh, artists could uh, could engage with. And um, it was also part of the fact that it was a little bit more anonymous on 14th Street. In Lower East Side, it kind of uh, it's because it's a smaller area. Um, I think word just kind of got around. Everyone knew it was happening, and the anonymity of 14th Street is part of one of the things that really uh, we try to play into, like art in odd places. Um, it's the fact that it's you can be walking. That's the beauty of New York, where it's like you can be walking to work randomly uh, in a fall day, and then suddenly there's someone performing in front of you and you have to stop and think like, wait, is this art or is this so like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> is this a mentally unwell person? I don't know. <laughs> and, um, and I think, um, and uh, it, we have, uh, we always, every year we like, we meet people who have lived in New York City for 20, 30 years, their whole lives, and they never knew we were around uh, similar people who were like, oh, I, I've lived on 14th Street my entire life. I had no idea you guys were here. And, um, I was similarly, I partially grew up in the city and I've been involved in the art world for a number of years, but it was only after I graduated uh, college that I realized art in other places existed. And um, on one hand, we every year we try to like branch out a little further, get some more uh, gets more eyes on the festival. Um, and every year I think, you know, our network expands a little bit more, but there is something nice about the fact that it, it's this very random thing. And even, um, especially the last two years, usually the festival takes place in mid to late October, but uh, last year, 2021, because of the pandemic, we started late. So we ended up having the festival in May. And then this year uh, to kind of fare with better weather, we decided to push the festival ahead one uh by one month to kind of i mean it still ended up being very cold <laughs> which was just our luck but uh but you know in the hopes i'd be slightly warmer um but yeah it's uh, so even even the date and the time is flexible too it just kind of has this sense of randomness to it which i think only adds to it but you know it is hard marketing <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but yeah Anyone else? <laughs> um, do any of the artists find themselves in their hometown working on this on their streets, uh, doing anything like this similar, not on 14th Street, but <laughs> either where they live, either in New York or a different country or city? Oh, I guess Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in Pittsburgh, I did this on the um, uh, the city uh, state building. Um, yeah, I almost got arrested. Yeah, I can't hold it. Um, uh, I actually um, am performing more now at my city in Atlanta, Georgia. I recently was a recipient of the Margaret Carpo Artists as Activist Grant for Idea Capital of Atlanta, Georgia. So I'll be premiering three um, installs of my Reverend performance pieces. That's actually why uh, I first met Jenna when I was at Paseo in 2019, and then I was a resident um, artist for Paseo Projects in 2021. And I premiered Reverence in uh, Taos, New Mexico. And it's all about, uh, you know, basically just reminding people that whether through age or accident, the disabled community is one that you're going to join. It's just a matter of time. So it's asking for, um, it's advocating for inclusion, equity, and equality in the disabled, aging, LGBTQ plus communities, um, because those are the communities that have the most intersectionality. So I haven't, 
I've done one piece, maybe two pieces that were different in my own state, but um, I'll be doing this particular body of work this, this month. Actually, I, I told them I, I can't do it right now. I are not places has got me, like I, I, I gotta do all this. And we're pushing this back to the fall. And also, I'm four three, hot flashes are real. And it's <laughs> not me, pretty smooth style on a good day. So, <laughs> kind of like, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering. It probably is not possible to do. But is there a type who responds to you? Like being, you know, tethered on the highlight. Was that woman older, younger, or with the rest of you? Young people. Is it really anything else? Is there? This is a question that all of us could probably answer, but we'll start here. I noticed um, it was pretty much anyone going down to the river. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People, they, I guess they were going to work and things like that, but in doing their day. And um, they, so there were older people, there were young people, there were children, uh, there, were, there were animals, which I'm fearful of. So I'm glad that we kind of maintain those. Um, I was very fortunate to have a, a volunteer who was, jeez, <laughs> attacked. <laughs> By a chair. <laughs> uh, but um, and she was just, my volunteer, she was a beast. She helped me find out the place. She made sure I was comfortable. She made sure that people were not entering my environment when she could. And um, so, yeah, it was just, it was um, anybody, any passersby. And it, it was cool. We haven't been out yet, but in the past, we would have expected more like lefty abolitionist type folks to commission portraits from Juan, but we found that art makes it really accessible for people to engage with him. Um, I think mostly because everyone wants their portrait done or their cat's going to <laughs> So yeah, he's been able to make a lot of connections that I don't think would have otherwise been possible because of the art that he makes. Um, I don't have any expectation so, um, I'm open for them. Um, I was not able to get out today. Um, I will be tomorrow and the day after. And I haven't done any performance uh, work at all, so I don't have anything to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was down at the river, um, and um, I, you know, I. I have a big garment that I'm wearing, so it easily catches some attention. And um, people do tend to hover. I can't see in it either. It's all the way up my, over my eyes. So I can't really see who's around, but like I hear people like walking over me and stuff like that. So like they do congregate, does get some attention. I don't know what else they're doing aside from maybe taking pictures, I think. Um, but I'm okay with that. Um, I'm here to take up space, so I'm taking up a lot of it. <laughs> oh, I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> I, I felt like it was very random who wanted to stop and share, and it, there was no type. Um, it felt different than when I did it in Taos, where I know most of the people. Either they shared because they were my friend and they just wanted to be a rock star, or they <laughs> um, were too shy. So here it felt like people didn't have the same kind of shyness, which was really nice. Um, a lot of people looked and took photos that didn't talk, but the people that talked <laughs> seemed really genuine. So that felt really good. I have a follow-up question. What does the instruction look like? So for people who might be shy, for example, yeah. what does that instruction look like? I instruction am asking people if they want to share their story. If they look curious, I say, do you want to share your story? Or would you like to talk into the microphone? You can also sing whatever you feel like sharing. Um, some people just, that's a little overwhelming. But one person came back after I gave them that and, and they shared, so that was really sweet. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I'm gonna follow up on that. 
was wondering if there were um, audiences um, congregating to hear the stories. So not to participate themselves, but they wanted to observe. Not really. <laughs> Maybe <it's> not. <laughs> Sorry, another follow-up question. Do you start off your story or a story? No. No, because I, I I'm so nervous about is this gonna work? Is it gonna feedback? What's happening? Right. And so then that I think just me and my kind of nervous energy kind of draws people in already. <laughs> What's she doing? <laughs> Thank you. Are you recording? I'm not. No, I feel like it should be spontaneous, and people don't need to have that pressure. I don't like that we live in this world where everything feels recorded. So let's just have a moment. Do you know about the some of the other similar type of uh, artist programs that happen in New York City? No, I'm from such a rural place. There, there was a, there's a group called Improv Everywhere. They've done something similar. But the most famous one is, I don't remember the artist who did it, by um, a giant full uh, horn in uh, Battery Park City. Oh, cool. And I don't know if anyone knows it, but yeah. I don't know who the artist was. It's a really cool picture of a red, you know, it's just, it's a really John Ralph Eric Rothenberg, and I can't remember the name of the artist. Thank really you. Cool. cool. And they didn't, they, Neither of those groups are also going to record, but it'd be cool to record. <laughs> it'd be cool for you. <laughs> right. I wouldn't want to put that pressure on people, I think, is kind of how I feel about it. New York. Also, I wondered, did that microphone get permits? Because I was researching when you make sound, you have to have a permit. Right. Uh, those were, um, well, if I ever worked out, um, and the other one got a permit, but it was an art project. So there was no uh, sound. It was just people. Oh, cool. It was one of those ones that. Oh, like a megaphone. That megaphone. Yes. yes. There yeah. was no, I didn't see. It. I didn't see it. Cool. Pick that up. Thanks. Did you go to it? Yeah. Oh, oh. do you have to tell more about it? <laughs> people would stand. You go up the steps. This platform with this giant megaphone. Start yelling. Then you're at the <laughs> All right. Well, if I'm checking the time correctly, I think we are actually coming to a close tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. <laughs>
Please. 